welcome to a dive into clay instruments and ceramic laureate of music. I am Sophia Albers. I am getting my BA in music here at Martin. Um, and I'm so excited to show you guys. But first, a disclaimer. Um, I am a college student, not an archeologist or historian. So what I'm presenting is what I've learned from bunches of scholarly articles. Um, I've been doing pottery for about a year and a half also. So um, I'm by no means an expert in that field as well. Um, I ask that you hold your questions till the very end. Um, please, that aside, let's get into it. So a little preface. Um, since the dawn of civilization, clay has served as a fundamental material for human expression and utility. From the Neolithic, Neolithic ages, present day, its versatility has been harnessed for a range of purposes from practical vessels to musical instruments. We'll be going on a journey through history, delving into the rich collections of clay instruments and their historical significance and cultural context, as well as discussing my own iterations and experimentations of classic instruments. My goal is to explore the diverse array of clay instruments, shedding a light on their evolution, construction methods, and cultural importance by investigating the symbiotic relationship between ceramic artistry and musical expression the importance of clay instruments and cultural heritage and artistic evolution will be underscored. So firstly, what is pottery? I'm sure you guys may have an idea what pottery is. It's cups and bowls made from clay, but what is it exactly? Pottery refers to the art and craft of creating objects from clay, which are shaped and then fired at high temperatures to achieve durability and permeance. This can be anything from bowls, cups, tableware, vases, figurines, decorations, storage vessels, and musical instruments. The process um, I used to make pottery looks a lot like this. Um, as you can see, it's kind of lengthy. You make it, let it dry, trim, put in a kiln, fire it, glaze it, and then you put it in a kiln, fire it again, and then it's done. So it's a very long process. Um, it will also help to understand um, better like terms, so I'm going to explain some terms first before we get into the actual instruments. So firstly, starting from the beginning, these are some techniques I use for wet clay. There is wheel throwing, which is kind of what it sounds like. You have a spinning wheel and you use, uh, or you throw the clay on the wheel and then you use gravity to form and shape it how you like. Um, it's my preferred method of making stuff. Then we also have coiling, which is when you roll clay into thin like strips um, and then stack it on top of each other and adhere it together. It is best for bigger kind of vessels, um, which is a kind of one of the methods I use to make this. And then there's of course hand building, which is one of the most primitive methods and it's basically just using your hands and like minimal tools. So. Um, clay should be completely dry before the next step, which is firing it in a kiln. Firstly, um, kilns. So here's some examples. They can be large industrial, they can be small for houses and home potters, and they can be homemade. They can be made with bricks and stone in your backyard. So really cool. So. Um, a kiln is an insulated furnace used for hardening pottery at extremely high temperatures. A piece will usually undergo two firings in a kiln to be finished. The first firing is a bisque firing. Um, it's the first step to harden the clay into ceramic and prep for the glaze. Usually bisque firings are slightly less hot than glaze firings. Um, you have to be careful about the moisture in the actual vessel because if there's any moisture in it bef before you fire it, it will explode or at the very least crack. So it's very dangerous. <laughs> and then the second firing is called a glaze firing, which activates the chemistry of the glazes to make a glossy or matte finishing on the piece. There are so many types of glaze firings too. There's soda firing, raku firing, sawdust firing, pit firing, etc. Um, there's also a wide range of kilns. You can use you can use gas, wood, or electric. You can have huge kilns, you can have small kilns. There's just so many possibilities. So just for the glaze firing, 
It can usually take around eight and a half hours to fire a glaze load, and it takes around the same amount of time to let it cool after that. So it is a very lengthy kind of ordeal. So the next one, clay bodies. These are some examples of clay bodies. They're kaolin, earthenware, stoneware, ball clay, and fire clay. They each react to temperatures differently, so it's kind of hard to figure out what you're trying to do. Each kind of clay reacts differently to each step in the pottery process. And there's actually a little thing called shrinkage, which happens when a piece is firing in your kiln. And it's basically what it sounds like. It like shrinks in the kiln. So if a potter's trying to make a 16 ounce cup, and they make it 16 ounce when it's wet, it usually shrinks around 14 ounce. So potters have to keep that in mind if they want to make very specifically sized vessels. Each clay body also has a different set percentage of shrinkage, which can be hard to keep in mind when potters want to make something very specifically sized, as I said. And some people actually source their own clay from local earth, but it can take a lot of time to figure out how to it, how to figure out how it reacts to each step of the process. Experimentation is very important in this stage. If you're trying new things, patience and failure is key. If there's anything I've learned from pottery is that failure is good. Most of these I consider failures, but it will help me to be better in the future. And it's really cool to see, actually see the difference. So the clay we generally use in the studio here is a high fire stoneware, which it means it's like very, it's fired very hot temperatures, like at least 2000 degrees. So all of these instruments are made with stoneware. And now we go on to the glazes. Visually, ceramic glazes can be decorative and a great source of color and texture. Practically, glazes can seal your clay bodies once fired, making them waterproof and food safe. This is pretty much just pure chemistry and chemical reactions. I am not very good at chemistry myself, so I didn't make these glazes. <laughs> um, they're made from chemicals like metal oxides, sodium, potassium, zinc, kaolin, feldspar, and iron. Potters can also just buy glazes if they don't want to make the glaze themselves. Uh, most of these are glazes we have made in the, uh, in the studio here, but the only difference, or the only thing that's not is these underglaze ones that are just like painted on. We buy the underglaze and we just paint it on. So, and that's one over there too. <laughs> Again, lots of things can go wrong, like glaze dripping down and melting to the kiln shelf, and uh, it can melt the piece and the kiln shelf together. So that is very extremely hard to remove. So we don't want that to happen, which is what happened on um, bottom left here. The glaze kind of crawled down onto the shelf, and boom, it's stuck. Usually, um, sometimes pieces may be destroyed this way, but sometimes you can salvage them. So, getting into the music side of things. It is said that music is the universal language. Ancient human descendants may have developed a sense of music around 50,000 years ago during prehistoric eras, a time of massive, massive cultural growth, which included the rise of additional forms of art, jewelry, and traditions. It wasn't until nomads started settling because of resources that they would have the time and opportunity to be around um, play and experiment with it. Since music preceded the use of clay, it is important to note that early instruments were in fact not clay, but were made from, from organic materials like wood and animal bones, because it was what was available to them. Usually inorganic materials like clay and stone are preserved better than organic ones such as bone and wood, so it's likely the first instruments have been long disintegrated. We will probably never ever find them, but that's okay. The use of these early instruments may have been used to signal hunts, rituals, and signs of dangers. So on the left here we have a bone flute. In the middle we have some sort of string instrument with animal skin and wood. And then we got some sort of nut kind of shaker. So without further ado, let's get into our first instrument type. The Udu drum. 
Ta-da. It originated from the Igbo people of Nigeria, and it evolved from clay pots. Udu actually means pot in the Igbo language. You can see Igbo land is right there in Nigeria. So it is a struck idiophone, and plosive aerophone means it produces sound by vibration of its clay body and causes air to vibrate inside it by clapping a hand over the sound hole and tapping. So some examples of idiophones may be cymbals, maracas, and gongs. So new, no udus have membranes of leather or skin. If there is leather or skin on them, they're not really an udu. They're a different kind of drum, usually. So these drums were primarily played by women and made by women because they were first pioneered by women. They were used in women's ceremonies and rituals. The rituals that they would have would bridge a connection to their ancestors and spirits, and music was very sacred due to the significance of ancestor worship in this society. It grew to be used in established churches in Africa eventually, and today maybe you can hear it in reggae bands and African pop, and some percussions may also play it. Um, it could be also used as a storage vessel for water and grain, or to even house bees, because um, it came from the pot, and it's basically a pot, so. Um, this is just a quick example of what udu sounds like, so you have something to compare with my own udu sound. sounds pretty watery, but there is no water inside the drum. That's just how it sounds like. Uh, I'm by no means a percussionist, but um, I'll play a quick example for you guys. I just want to... the process. I started this drum uh, January 31st. I think that was during that crazy snow week that we had at the beginning of the year. Um, and this is just for the wet stage. Um, it can be very lengthy and intensive, so it took me a little bit more than a month. So the actual process of it is um, I started with those tools on the left, a bowl and some clay. So I rolled the clay into thin, like a thin, like kind of thing. And then I slumped the clay over the bowl to get a bowl shape. And that would be what I used to make the bottom of this. I let it dry a little bit more and then I started coiling, which I pulled out thin clay coils and then adhered it all the way up until the top here. And then I used also another clay slump mold to make the kind of dome shape at the top to make it more equal to the bottom. And then from there, I cold coiled coiled and then it was done. Here's a quick video of me trying to smooth out the drum. Um, it takes a lot of time to smooth out this much clay. Um, it still even looks a little bit lumpy. But, yeah. Hmm. 
and then I let it dry completely. So that's it dried completely. And then it was ready for the bisque fire. Um, so it got bisque fired on March 7th. It turned pink once it got bisque fired, which is usually what happens. And once it has been bisque fired, it cannot be used as clay again. So it was basically ceramic. So it was stuck like this forever. So I don't have to worry about it crumbling under the pressure of itself anymore. So, and then I used the underglaze to paint a little design on it. And then I also started working on a little older version, so maybe compare sounds. The second drum I made is from, or I made it from wheel throwing on the wheel. So I like formed it how I liked and then boom. Here's it being fired in the kiln. This is the kiln we have on campus. Um, so as you can see, this is uh, our logs of the kiln. It started around 8 a.m. and it ramped up temperatures until 5 p.m. when it turned 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. Very hot. That's when I took this video, so there's like fire blowing everywhere. <laughs> So after that, it was gradually cooled down, and then, voila, it was done. So these are what they look like now. Next instrument, the ocarina slash zoon. The first ocarinas from, uh, were from China and Mesoamerica 12,000 years ago. People in China specifically realized that swing by swinging hollow balls of clay, thought to be for hunting, could make an interesting sound. From there, they realized that, hey, it made an interesting sound. So they tried to manipulate the sound with their mouth. And that's where the shun came from. In the Mesoamerica, on the other side of the world, the Aztecs, Mayans, and Incans of Mesoamerica shaped their ocarinas into birds or animal forms. It is believed that the ocarinas were also accompanied by other percussive instruments and in dance, suggesting they were commonly played in ceremonies, rites, and celebrations of their culture. Um, so, in relatively recent years, a portion of Ocarina media seen today is from popular video games that use the instrument, like the NES games Earthbound and some games from the Legend of Zelda series. I believe that these popular games have helped shine a light on the beauty of the Ocarina in the modern day that might otherwise be left to classical and specific cultural uses. So, very cool. Here's some um, examples comparing the sound of the ocarina and the zhun. The first one is an ocarina and the second one is a zhun. similar because they're pretty similar. They got the mouthpiece and finger holes to make the sound. So here's some parts of the ocarina that might be helpful to know. Um, and I actually tried to make an ocarina but um, ended up being really hard actually. I tried multiple times uh, but I could only produce a sound on one version which turned into a whistle because when I tried to add finger holes to it it wouldn't sound. You may be wondering, uh, it doesn't seem too hard to just make a body and a mouthpiece and uh, make an aperture, but no. The aperture has to be very sharp and in the exact right position to make the sound. The angle of the aperture needs to be exactly 45 degrees. 
um, and be able to cut the wind in half. So this is the only one that I got to work. The mouthpiece is right here and the aperture is right here. And I tried to add finger holes, but it didn't work. <laughs> so, which leads me to the whistle. The whistle is an aerophone, meaning you can make sound from it by blowing wind into it. During the Paleolithic era of the Stone Age, it is likely that humans had experimented by blowing bo into bones and pieces of wood, discovering the unexpected phenomenon of sound resonance. This discovery might have elicited feelings of astonishment and bewilderment as they encountered what appeared to be a form of inexplicable magic. In the past, it was used as a ritual object in ancient Egypt, prehistoric China, and Mesoamerican cultures. They were associated with breath and life, as well as fertility and seasonal rituals, and as a way to communicate with the divine. So it makes sense that they were also used to ward off evil as well. However, because they were thought to be ward off evil, they were given to young children to protect them, which caused their use to become more toy-like than ritualistic. The same thing happens with rattles, shakers, and clappers as well. Now whistles are the most commonly, most commonly used for attention by police, s schools, and armies, and sailors. So usually they're made by metal also to get that bright, piercing sound. So I think you all know how whistles sound generally, so I'll skip to my process. For the whistle I have today, I basically followed these instructions. I made two kind of hemispheres of clay. I put them together. I made a separate mouthpiece. I adhered it to the ball. Then I stuck a stick through the mouthpiece into the ball, which served as the wind way. And then while the stick was inserted, I cut a very sharp angle into the body right after the mouthpiece. And so yeah, eventually, I eventually got it to work. There's the finished product, and here's how it sounds. So, yeah. <laughs> Next, we have the bells and the chimes. I'll talk about them um, like they're the same since they're so similar. The bell has a clapper inside that hits the side of the vessel to produce sound while chimes don't have anything inside and instead make noise by hitting other vessels. These are struck idiophones, making sound from something hitting them and causing them to vibrate and make sound. Bells are also often associated with the passage of time, deterring spirits and clocks and celebrations. And the word bell actually comes from Old English's bell on, which means to roar or make a loud noise. The first bell and clay bell was made from Neolithic China and Japan. After the Bronze Age in China in the 16th century, bells were primarily made from bronze and metals for their unique tone. There are also significant differences in the sound of Chinese and Western bells. Chinese bells produce a deep, cohesive sound, while Western bells produce a bright, loud sound, displaying the differences in national sound characteristics caused by deep cultural traditions and environment of each um, culture. These bells are symbols of ideas, cultures, and spirits. Like the drum, the size of the instrument translates to higher or lower pitch sounds. In the Western world, it can be argued that the most significant use of bells today is during the Christmas season to celebrate the birth and arrival of Jesus Christ. Bells have a super wide array of possible sounds, but I'm sure you'll have also listen to bells and chimes in places like people's porches and garden centers. So, onto the process. To make the bells, I first made a body shape by throwing it on the potter's wheel upside down. So it would look like this, like a cup. Um, then I attached the handles to the top and poke, poked a hole for a cord to go through, uh, which is those holes at the top there. Um, I also tried making chimes using terracotta clay, but it didn't really work out. Um, so let me play you a quick example of all the bells. 
And also I used a rope and metal bolts as the clappers for all these, pretty much. This one didn't work because the glaze was too far down that it would interrupt the sound. So that's why it sounds all messed up. <laughs> This one I tried using these, so it's a softer sound. And this one actually ended up, um, I tried to make it an amplifier, like those ones over there, but when I was trimming the piece, I actually poked a hole through the back here, so I was like, screw it, I'm going to make it a bell. And the shape actually worked out pretty well for that. terracotta chimes that ended up not working, so they sound like pretty dull. Not really what chimes are supposed to sound like. <laughs> so the reason that the terracotta chimes did not work out was the porosity, which means the more space within the clay itself, the less sound projects. It gets trapped inside the clay itself. And then we have amplifiers. Clay instruments that can be played are not the only clay instruments that exist. Observing that sound echoes from pots and clay vessels, humans realized that pots, are, that pots don't have to be played. They can just amplify sound already being produced. Neolithic age humans most likely observed the bouncing vibrations of sound, particularly in caves. And there is considerable evidence that exists for proof of organized sound in prehistory, which is like cave sound. So I'll talk about three examples of the amplifiers. The first is dolia. Dolia is also the plural name for dolium. They were used to make, transport, and store wine. They could carry as much as 3,000 liters or 700-ish gallons uh, at the most, and they were up to six feet tall. Very huge. The jars were also very extremely hard to produce because of their size and extremely expensive, costing more than a month's worth of wages for manual labors at the time. Its unique chemical and physical characteristics from the terracotta used for the, these containers proved to be a perfect ther thermal insulator for the fermenting wine. Dolia were recognized for their acoustic qualities and became something that most theaters used to make louder sounds and sound effects. Moving on to the next one, is acoustic jars. Also known by the Greek name echia, or echo, or sounding vases. These are clay vessels implanted into the walls of ancient churches and theaters. They were commonly built into places in Europe between the 10th and 16th century or more. Their goal was to amplify the sound coming from either choir, singers, or performers, but their effectiveness has been debated. Modern experiments by archaeoacousticians have indicated that the effect, jars, the effect the jars would have been to absorb the resonance of certain frequencies instead of actually amplifying the sound, as some thought and what was intended. Acoustic jars have been discovered in around 200 churches, about half of them in France. Researchers discovered that you see these pots in the 19th century, so perhaps these pots may come into use again if technology of the speakers were to fail and more research was done on the effectiveness of these pots. So the next one is modern clay amplifiers. These were made inspired by dolium and have undergone change due to the invention of phones. Um, most of these have a phone slot. You just put your phone in and play music and it should work to amplify the sound. So here's some inspiration I took to make these um, from Pinterest and Etsy. Um, so onto the process. Firstly, I threw an upwards conical shape on the wheel. So it would look like this, like an upwards bell. 
Then I added a little foot and a rectangular hole where the phone would sit. I had to measure out how the phone would sit so it could actually fit in there. The first two that I made on the left weren't standing up on their own with the weight of the phone in them, so I tried a third version right there. I'm much happier with the third version because I wanted to have it to have like a resonating chamber that it would actually capture more sound. And I made it a little bit more stable, but still not as stable as I would like. Um, so the more resonant one is the third version. Here are all my amplifiers together, plus doo doo drum. Uh, when it was glazed, uh, this is also something I wanted to show you guys. Um, this is with the glaze on them. The glazes look completely different before they're actually fired. So these have like a pinkish kind of color, but after they're fired, they ended up being like a blue kind of copper and like a kind of copper tannish kind of color. So I'll play a quick sound example. This is home by resonance. Stand. <laughs> All right, that one. Then another one. Sort of works, sort of. And then the one I think does actually work. more resonance and directional sound, so it's pushing the sound out to you. Yeah. Pretty cool. <laughs> I am much happier with the third version than the first ones, which is why experimentation is important and failure is also important. Those are the finished Things. They're very shiny, very, very nice looking. So here's my sources. And in conclusion, despite the emergence and growing use of alternative materials such as metal, brass, and plastic, clay endures as a timeless resource being perpetually available and adaptable. These instruments from drums to amplifiers were crafted within cultural context for pur purposes that may differ from contemporary uses. Yet their evolution from sacred ritual artifacts to commonplace items, and eventually relics of bygone eras, reflects the intricate tapestry of human development. I am so blessed to have been able to experiment and play with clay to make these instruments, given their long historical backgrounds. And if you get the chance, I encourage you all to try pottery for yourself. There's um, just something so natural and magical about being able to play with clay and make music. With all that said, questions? Yeah? What happened with your hands and feet that you lost earlier? Um, I would say the amplifier right here I think has more modern use than my second favorite, this big drum. Um, yeah, you can like it's good for like getting monetary things also. People actually buy amplifiers and usually what they wouldn't like buy just a huge drum unless you're like a percussionist, so. were the easiest for me because they were so easy to just throw into cup shapes and just make into these little shapes. I made these actually last year. These other instruments I made all of this year. So 
it was when I was like a little bit more amateurish, <laughs> but it was still very natural to me. And the bells look pretty um, similar to, to each other, very similar forms. Um, with my growing um, experience with pottery, um, I would try to make a drum that was less big than this because it's hard to support like this much mass on thin clay strips, so it's pretty thick. Um, but I'd like to make it a little bit thinner um, and bigger than this. So what I would do is try to throw a udu drum on the wheel using probably at least five pounds of clay, but it would take like practice and practice of experimentation to actually get to that level that I could actually make a drum with that. So. Any more questions? Thank you all for coming out. Um, uh, thank you all for sacrificing your time for me. I am very humbled. <laughs> I want to personally thank Dr. Fry for being a fantastic teacher and even more fantastic human. Um, thank you also for being so patient in my four years that I've been here. It takes a lot of patience to <laughs> be here <laughs> um, with a lot of students. Um, thank you for my family for coming out here and watching all my concerts whenever they came around. Um, and thank you for giving me the freedom to fly or soar, as we Skyhawks say. <laughs> um, thank you for my friends Peyton and Weston. Weston's back there in the booth running the stream and take, taking pictures. Thank you for showing me love and trust and loyalty and teaching me how to have a good time. Um, thanks for being so spontaneous. It's one of the things I wanted in college, to have more freedom and spontaneousness. And we still got to go to Chicago. <laughs> um, thank you to my boyfriend watching on the stream for sticking with me and investing in us, even though we're both busy as hell. <laughs> um, and thank you for watching me change through college and loving me all the same. So, that's it. Feel free to come up and ask more questions or I'll let you like touch the instruments or even play it um, or get a better look at what I got here. If I don't get the chance to chat with you, have a fantastic day. That's it. <laughs>